questions on uh, course logistics that I can help with? You've seen that, um, maybe from there. You've seen that the practice questions are up on BSpace and that I won't put answers up anytime soon. So the intention is that um, you will um, try the questions and talk about them with your colleagues as a means of learning about them. Um, any, any questions on course logistics that I can help with now? Yes. No, the midterm um, is 33 questions, yeah. She asked if that's how long the midterm is. No, that is not meant to reflect the midterm in any way. And this is the danger of giving you guys practice questions. Uh, I don't think all the instructors will do that because students tend to think that this is what the midterm is like. Can't promise that. I haven't written the midterm yet. I don't know what the midterm is going to be like. Might be a lot harder. Don't know. But um, it is important for you guys to understand what a, uh, what a multiple choice question is like that I write. I didn't write all of the ones I just gave you, but um, I wrote some of them. And uh, they are much like the types that I will ask you, but they could be harder on the test. So don't slack off, please. What else? Anything else? OK. Um, Feel free to email me if, if anything comes up that you need answers to. We are um, continuing today with ecosystem ecology. <coughs> and we will first cover um, we will first cover some geology, really, as a means of understanding the physical basis for observed patterns on a global scale in the biota in biological communities and ecosystems. We will review the terrestrial biomes of the world very briefly. Your book covers it well. Um, in the context of global precipitation and temperature patterns, climographs, we will look at aquatic biomes focusing on the physical structure of uh, lakes and oceans and consider nutrient limitation and um, productivity of such systems. And then consider productivity of ecosystems on a global scale, comparing biomes um, to one another. We, I put something in here on diversity gradients and um, the causes be behind high tropical diversity. Hopefully we'll get to. It's something I haven't put in before and I want to get to um, during the lecture cycle. So I put it in, but I didn't bullet it here. And I'm not sure if we'll get to hydrological and biogeochemical cycles. If we don't, I may just give you the slides and ask you to review it in the book because um, I don't want to go into much more detail than the book already provides. All right, so for some of you, this will be review. For others, uh, perhaps not for everyone, this is of interest and importance because you are earthlings and uh, you are subject to these forces of global climate and um, more and more pressing are these, um, these forces with the changes uh, that we're seeing in recent decades, recent centuries as a result of human activities. Um, the first thing to consider, and I won't review much here, is the fact that the earth as a result of being spherical um, receives solar energy with greater intensity in the equatorial regions as a result of the more direct strike of photons in those regions. The sun's rays strike more obliquely toward the poles and this means less solar input. The earth is also tilted on its axis and it orbits the sun and as a result um, we have our seasonal cycles. The details of that uh, physical uh, process isn't, isn't of importance, but you can read about it in the book if you want to. It's not of importance for, uh, for our purposes. Note that because of the intensity of solar energy at the equator, that water 
evaporates in this area, and as the air is heated, it rises. Upon rising, this now moist air releases that moisture. It condenses out and rains, and generates the phenomenon of the hot, wet tropics, hot, wet tropical region. As the air continues its ascent, losing moisture, it cools and becomes denser, and it's dry, and it descends. Note where we are on the Earth. We're some 23 to 30 degrees um, north latitude here, but the same phenomenon is happening in the south of the equator, to the south of the equator. And this dry descending air absorbs moisture, um, actually pulls moisture you know, from the land and out of the air. And as a result, these tend to be very arid regions. And your great deserts of the world are indeed situated at these latitudes, north and south. Your Atacama Desert, one of the driest places on Earth. Your um, North American Great Southwestern Deserts. That air, <coughs> that dry air, some of which, some of it, will then travel northward. It's, it's warm, it's going to rise, it's picking up moisture, and it drops it again in this part of the world. Not as much as is dropped in the tropics, but still a lot. And this generates the phenomenon of, of our temperate rainforests, like we have on the Olympic Peninsula, say, in Washington. So, uh, or even in some areas of California, where you get the very big trees and very dense forests with lush vegetation growth as a result of this very phenomenon. Something similar is happening, <coughs> something similar is happening in Patagonia, in southern Chile, Argentina, with these temperate rainforests as opposed to tropical rainforests. And then you can follow it further as that air, some of that rising air, now dry, descends over the poles dry air absorbing, absorbing even more moisture, and the poles are, um, are quite desiccated and cold, of course. So you can see from um, a solar driver um, at the equator how much can be explained about not only global air circulation patterns and precipitation, but vegetation. Also very cool. Uh, the details are not critical. I'll just highlight a few things here, though. Um, the, the fact that the warming of the ocean surfaces at the equator as a result of intense solar energy um, produces a north circulating current on the surface waters, the hot air, the hot water um, being at the surface, it cools as it, as it trends north, and that cool, denser water dives deep you know, this is the Gulf Stream, dives deep and circulates in deep channels all around the world. And this deep water may remain in these currents for as long as a thousand years or more um, before it makes its way back to the surface in the warmer water conditions. These, this interaction between warm and cold currents in this area produces a lot of fog. And something related is happening in our area with the fog that we see here. This is, in our area, related primarily to the temperature differential between our cold currents they're shown as uh, getting warmer here. They are getting warmer, but they're still very cold currents that we experience off our coast. And the interaction of those cold currents with warm air masses um, is in part responsible for the generation of fog over, over our waters offshore here. Now, with the generation of this fog uh, over, the, over the oceans here, some of it's pulled onto land. Some of it's pushed onto land by winds behind it, but some of it is pulled onto land as a result of, of the action of warm air over the land rising. Think of how hot it gets in the interior of California or in the hills or just over the hills here in summertime. This warm air is rising, and the cool air from the, from the oceans is being drawn in 
to replace that warm rising air. And there's often fog in the summertime in that air being pulled onto land. Sometimes works in cycles where uh, that air conditioning fog cools the air over the land and uh, interrupts this kind of cycle. So I'm highlighting that in relation to the fog here, but this has a moderating effect on climate in coastal areas in general because the warm land air is going to be replaced by cool marine air. And that's what makes the coasts um, more moderate in their climates than areas inland. And something similar is happening over the oceans themselves where the warmer air from the land is warming up the cool oceanic air. But um, let's, let's look at this fog phenomenon because it's one of the uh, really interesting characteristics of our position right here on Earth and has a great effect on local ecosystems uh, as evidenced by uh, research conducted in this department in relation to the vegetation and in relation to redwood communities. Look at the levels of fog across the year. It's really foggy in the summer, right? That's why San Francisco is so darn cold in the summer because of this fog. We've had a very foggy summer. At least the early part of the summer here was extremely foggy, not much sunshine. And when this, when these fog levels are so high, look at look at rainfall. Rainfall is at its lowest points around the same time that fog peaks. Think of this in terms of plant need, the plant plants and organisms need for water. How do we possibly get such massive forests growing in this area when rainfall is so low during the hottest times of the year? As you might suspect, it's related to this fog phenomenon. And um, some of the research on this is just fabulous. It's done by um, various teams of researchers, including the Dawson lab, Todd Dawson's lab here. These are th these w the study I'm going to show you is it's a study in ecophysiology, and the data that they rely on for untangling this phenomenon is is the science of biogeochemistry. <coughs> Those are things you'll hopefully investigate further in your educations here. And I'll talk a little more about biogeochemistry next week. Um, here's a, just showing the fog off offshore, I mean, burr, right? Um, so I, someone I heard once say, well, it's kind of like a cozy blanket. And if you think of it that way, it's a little more acceptable, but um, it can really be make things frigid throughout much of the summer here. Okay, so you don't need to understand isotope chemistry to understand this study in biogeochemistry. Biogeochemistry. Let me just skip back to that real quick. Look at that word. Bio, life, right? Geo, earth. Chemistry, chemistry. <laughs> so biogeochemistry is the study of this kind of interactive system. It's, a, it's, a, it's the use of um, chemistry um, to study the interaction between life and earth. It's chemistry to study living ecosystems. Ecophysiology, it's physiology related to the ecology of individual organisms in the context of local ecosystems. These are great integrative fields and uh, no surprise that there are those in this department in integrative biology who who, uh, who are superb in this work. As I said, you don't need to understand uh, isotopes um, from a chem in a chemical sense to understand this work. Just, just to say that, you know, elements, atomic elements exist in different isotope, isotopic forms as a result of differences in neutrons in their nucleus. So uh, an isotope ratio is the ratio of a heavy of a heavy at of a heavy heavy isotope to a light isotope. In this case, heavy hydrogen to light I hydrogen, deuterium to to hydrogen. But just recognize that this is a quantification of um, of atomic nuclei in relation to the water in fog 
and the water in rainfall. So rainwater here and fog water here, quantified by their hydrogen isotope ratio. Fog water is very heavy in hydrogen isotopes. It has a lot of the heavy isotope, deuterium, in it. Much different from rainfall, no overlap. They're completely distinct. When you look at various plants that grow in the rainforest community, including, I'm sorry, in the uh, redwood community, including redwoods themselves, sequoia, sempervirens, um, you see that the water inside these plants is of an isotopic ratio between the fog and the rainfall, and that it cycles in relation to both over the course of each year, these being the 12 months in three different years. You can do the math and determine that almost a third of the water used by the plants in these systems is coming from the fog itself. It's, it's the, the plants, the leaves are not drinking the fog, but the fog is collecting on the plants and dripping into the soils and being consumed by the plants. And, um, and that's fantastic. That's really cool. That's um, why you can get such magnificent forests of such complexity, probably, in these regions as a result of uh, fog input during the driest and hottest times of the year. Thus, and you might also think about what changes in fog levels, what kind of impact that would have on local communities um, in the context of global climate change. Fog is one phenomenon that's likely to change quite a lot. You may have heard of this phenomenon of um, air when ascending against a, a land mass um, drops its moisture during the ascent such that when it finds the leeward side of the mountain, it's, uh, it's lost all its moisture and has nothing to rain out. So on the leeward side of a mountain, you often get areas of great aridity. Think, uh, think of much of Nevada or the Mojave Desert in the south as a result of the rain shadow created by the Sierra Nevada, the Great Basin. It's a picture of Mojave, the Mojave Desert, which uh, many of you have probably been to. And some of your great cloud forests and uh, alpine wet forests may occur in these conditions. So that's some of the uh, global background to the distribution of vegetation on a you know very broad brush stroke, but it's helpful. And uh, you know we, we this is a science of macro climate and macro scale community structure. A biome is a community um, at a very large scale. It's a community that has that shares. <coughs> it's actually many communities that share certain characteristics such that they are distinguishable from collections of communities in neighboring areas. These are biomes. And they're distinct um, in terms of the organisms that live there, in terms of um, the climates that they're exposed to and partly driven by those climates. They're distinct in many ways. And so you need to take your macroscope to study these things. Some of the, uh, some ecologists speak of uh, leaving the microscope in the lab and taking out the macroscope and going into the field and seeing whole systems through that. Uh, it's a metaphor, obviously. Um, how, do you, how do you distinguish these biomes? You can do it yourself based on what you already know as a result of um, what some, what a uh, helpful term sometimes is physiognomy, the physiognomy of these systems. It's really just their, their general gestalt appearance, how they, how they look to you. Uh, this one has a bunch of waving grasses, some freeze o trees on the edges. Um, that's, a pretty, that's a pretty heavy forest and a grassy patch in the middle. Um, you may not know specifically what kind of ecosystem it is, but it looks like a dry forest. It looks like a seasonal dry forest or something like that. That might look like 
near some near a natural area near where you grew up, many of you from California, that's Chaparral, this this near area, with these um, no tr no trees of you know uh, the trees the trees are just very are small much smaller, in here mostly shrubby low lying growth um, that we call Chaparral. In the distance, you see more conifer forest. It's just how it looks. These are big trees. These are small, um, spindly trees, and these are shrubby, lower-lying bits of vegetation. This is the physiognomy of these systems. That's a very lush system with lots of epiphytic growth, plants growing on other plants. Um, these trunks are caked with green leaves. Um, uh, you, have, you have vines hanging down from the, the canopy. You have mosses growing on the rock. What kind of system do you think this is? Someone said a cloud forest. Yeah, it could very well be a cloud forest or a rainforest. Um, a tropical, tropical forest environment, probably. Some lush forest. This one looks more to me, very lush also, looks more to me like a temperate rainforest. Um, yeah, the ferns and uh, I don't know, maybe sorrel down there. I don't know. You'll you'll know better after the botany module what these things are. Or this uh, very characteristic um, open grassland tends to be dry. Occasional spotty trees. It's a savanna, right? It's a great savanna. You can tell by the stripy horses here that you're in Africa. that um, could be very nearby here. Um, these low, gradually um, s sloping hills, um, eroded. These eroded hilltops, grasslands, modified for agriculture or, ca <coughs> or grazing probably. Scattered trees, oaks, something like that. Could be a park in the East Bay. So I'm just giving you a hint of how you can just look at these systems and. Uh, you recognize their differences. You already do. It's because you, um, you have these sensory systems you use to distinguish th among them. It's just a natural thing to do. And so now let's put some technical names on them. And uh, so you know what to call them in the scientific sense. And that, uh, that, that will be the process of naming our terrestrial biomes. This is a, this is a climograph. We call this a climograph where on your axes of precipitation, and temperature, you can um, analyze the distribution of terrestrial vegetation um, more or less accurately. You know, this is a this is something of a cartoon, but it's based on based on real data. And uh, you can see that you can see how nicely um, these these biome types, these um, these vegetation types, can be modeled on just those two axes of temperature and precipitation. So if it's real hot, but really dry, you, you get a, a desert, a subtropical desert. A bit more water, you might have a dr tropical dry forest, like you saw in that one image, or a savanna. And if it's really hot, but really wet, talking about a rainforest. Does anyone know anything about savannas? What else helps to drive and structure them? We can talk about that in a minute. I, I just like savannas. <laughs> or if it's really cold and really dry, the tundra. <laughs> Somewhat more moisture, the high latitude forests, boreal forests. I'll show you pictures of all these. Okay, you get the idea. And then our temperate rainforests, where still there's a lot of moisture. Not as much as in a tropical rainforest, probably, and not as hot. But that's our temperate rainforest that you would get north of here if you drove up the coast. Cool. And uh, just another view, focused more on North America. The axes switch just for you to look at on your own time. So these are the, um, these are the biome types that your book provides, and we'll just stick with those. Um, and please look at the book for some of the details on the structure of these systems, what distinguishes them. I won't spend too much time on that. Um, and I've already mentioned 
most of these. Your tropical forests distributed around the world. This one from Borneo. But Central Africa, the Amazon, of course. Some fabulous ones in Central America, Southeast Asia. These are the, these are the tropical rainforests. These are intensely, intensely um, modified ecosystems um, for living space and for agriculture, and for uh, harvesting of timber. For so, and these are, these are the so-called lungs of the earth because of just how much um, the, the major importance of these systems in um, processing uh, carbon dioxide, for example. So the loss of these systems is, is of great importance to all of us as a result of uh, its influence on glo the global atmosphere. And much is being done um, to try to curtail the, the, uh, the destruction of these systems. Contrast that with the desert, you know, with your, with your plants heavily modified for uh, retaining moisture. Sometimes the leaves are just reduced to spines um, that serve a protective function, but also help to avoid water loss. Um, spacing in between the individual plants is, um, you, wouldn't see, you wouldn't see this kind of thing in a, in a rainforest where the, the canopy, the canopy just being the layer of uh, leafy growth of photosynthetic capture would be closed. You would speak of a closed canopy. This is a very open canopy. There's a lot of gaps in the canopy here. Um, and uh, yeah, savannas. So what is it about savannas? One thing that why, th why I don't really appreciate uh, putting them just onto a climograph so simply. What, what's, one thi what's one factor in savannas that's so important to their maintenance? Somebody must have an idea. Sorry? Herds of animals, yeah, grazing is a big, is of big importance in a, in a savanna. Um, and of very great importance. Um, so yeah, that's one factor. Yes? They often do have very drastic wet and dry seasons. Um, so does a dry seasonal forest. So why the, why a dry seasonal forest with thick forest patches that c still can survive a an, an intensive dry season, but in the savanna, just these scattered trees. Yes. Fires. Fires play a major role in these systems and um, help to structure what you see of its physiognomy here. Just, pat just individual trees often growing your beautiful spreading acacia that the giraffe might be nibbling on, um, as opposed to more extensive patches of forest that may not survive regular burns or something like that. So savannas are at least the African savannas are probably in many ways evolved to deal with um, regular fire input. <coughs> and it's certainly interesting to think about that in relation to human evolution that's been occurring there for millions of years and the domestication and use of fire by humans or human ancestors. California chaparral. Note that the, what we call chaparral um, occurs here in this Mediterranean climate where we have the hot, dry summer and a cool, moist winter. Forget fog in the equation for the moment because you get the chaparral occurring without, um, without major fog input, for example, in Southern California. So a hot, dry summer and a cool, fairly wet winter. That occurs not only here in California, but around the Mediterranean. So you sometimes hear of this as a Mediterranean climate, our climate as a Mediterranean climate, and this type of vegetation as a Mediterranean vegetation. It's nice, I think your book is the one that uses chaparral. That's great, because that's really a term from California. Let's export that to Europe, why not? Um, you also have something similar going on at, at the tip of Africa, um, maybe, a, maybe a bit in Australia, um, certainly a bit in, in Chile. So, but only in those, those spots do you get this kind of structured vegetation as a result of this unique combination of climatic factors? Pretty cool. These are also fire prone systems too, as we know all too well here. Temperate grasslands. 
some of your great um, agricultural growing regions, right? From these, what once were uh, vast temperate grasslands. The northern coniferous forests or boreal forests, marked primarily by the conifer trees, softwood trees, the pines and spruces and hemlocks and things like that, and the boreal forest zone. Um, very, it's a huge region. So if only for that reason, um, it's of great, great importance. Also um, intensely uh, harvested for timber and things, but uh, we speak of the lungs of the earth down here, but uh, th this region is also incredibly important for gas capture on a global scale. Temperate broadleaf forests. Um, these are the types of system I grew up in, and I just like I just love them. Uh, you know, you get your fall foliage colors as a result of dropping the leaves off the trees in the fall and winter. Um, it snows a lot in some of these areas, but it's really dry because snow is not available for uh, for uptake by plants. So that's that's a, that, that's a time of aridity for many plants is a period of winter when it's maybe a lot of precipitation, but it's not available for use. And it's also just cold and many plants can't function in low temperatures. So one of the uh, solutions plants use is to drop their leaves. They are deciduous. They drop the leaves during that season. The tundra, um, tr treeless. Um, this is latitudinally above tree line. You can get something similar if you ascend a mountain. You can ascend a mountain through the forests and get above tree line and get a f type of alpine tundra. You can do that in the Sierras or in the Rocky Mountains. And that highlights the fact that mountains, as you move up a mountain, you are, it's analogous to moving up in latitude. So you can see as you ascend a mountain in some cases, a marching through of these physiognomies, these, these biomes that you see at higher and higher latitudes. So you would want to distinguish the true tundra of north and uh, you know of the high latitudes against an alpine tundra that you would see up on uh, um, in a mountainous area. Lots of herbaceous growth, uh, no tree growth at all. Okay, let's um, let's switch to uh, the aquatic realm, and most broadly, we want to distinguish freshwater from marine water based on its concentration of salts. Um, and within freshwater systems, it's helpful to distinguish still water systems from flowing water systems. Terms, uh, fancy terms there if you want to use them. Lentic and lotic. Not sure if the book uses them. I find them helpful for um, flowing water systems, the lotic systems. So in a still water system like a lake, um, we divide it up in in a simple way that's, uh, and these terms, if you're talking about aquatic communities, you'll be using these terms just all the time. We distinguish these systems in terms of the light penetration, so the photic zone where light does penetrate and photosynthesis occurs with the maybe rooted plants in the shallows or uh, algae and bacteria uh, in these open areas, and then an aphotic zone where there's less light penetration or none at all at the, de at the depths. Also in terms of the distance from the shoreline and the depth, so the littoral zone is this near shore zone where you might get these rooted plants, and a limnetic zone further from shore um, and usually deeper. And let's talk about the pelagic, you'll often hear that term, the pelagic zone, just this open water zone, um, as against the against the benthic zone, the the zone on the substrate itself, um, marked by the community of organisms called the benthos, B E N T H O S, the benthos, uh, the unique organisms that live in the in the muck and mire, and on the surfaces of this zone, fantastic creatures there. So here are two, um, two lentic systems, um, one high elevation system with very clear, very clear waters, not much vegetation growth, and another system where the waters are very dark, can't, can't see the bottom here at all, 
and with abundant vegetation growing in it. Besides an elevational difference per here, here perhaps, um, let's assume that they're at the same latitude. They could be. What's, what's one difference in these systems in the, uh, the aquatic environment here? Substrate? Well, maybe, there are, maybe this is a rocky substrate here. You just can't see it because it's so dark. The water's so dark. Yeah. The water source probably differs, but let's just say that this is from uh, streams coming down out of these hills and that this one, there's hills in the foreground with streams entering it too. Yes. Temperature. Temperature. It looks, certainly looks warmer here than it does there. Um, so this is a somewhat higher, but let's focus on differences that might exist within the water itself. Uh, the temperature could exist within the water itself. This is probably a warmer body of water, I guess from appearances, but let's assume not. Yeah. Oxygen? Oxygen is likely to differ for partly as a consequence of the things I'm thinking of. Yes, yes. Light penetration will differ, um, partly because of the vegetation at the surfaces, but also as a result of the, uh, the lack of clarity signaling more sediment and more... Um, more stuff in the water, yes? Nutrients is the one I was thinking about firstly, um, but as a consequence of differences in nutrients, a lot of the other things you, you guys mentioned um, would, be, would be true also. Um, nutrients are typically the major limiting factor in the productivity of aquatic systems. Um, which nutrient it is may differ system to system, but it's usually nutrients. And this system is poor in nutrients, and as a result has little uh, vegetative growth, little less biological activity in general. As a result of less biological activity, there's going to be a greater amount of oxygen available, less used by the resp respiration of the organisms. This system with much more biological activity, less oxygen in the depth, has more nutrients. And our terms we need are oligotrophic and eutrophic. Oligotrophic and eutrophic. I think uh, at least eutrophic is here. A great experiment, a classic experiment in ecology um, showed the importance of nutrient inputs to lakes by dividing this sort of uh, dumbbell-shaped lake at the middle and putting nutrients into both sides of the lake, nitrogen, carbon, and phosphorus into this side. Sorry, nitrogen, carbon, and phosphorus into this side, and only nitrogen and carbon into this side. This is up in, uh, in northern Canada, and this was at a time when l lakes were seen to be showing these kinds of effects, where you had these blooms of algae or blooms of uh, bacteria in particular, cyanobacteria in particular, particularly in, in polluted waters. And it was a, a big concern to people when your waters go from being clear and swimmable to uh, choked with uh, undesirable growth. And what these investigators showed so starkly was the role of phosphorus and phosphates as a limiting nutrient, phosphorus as a limiting nutrient that when input could cause these types of blooms that would absolutely choke other organisms out as a result of uh, depletion of oxygen and alteration in the photic zone. Um, and phosphorus was entering waterways as a result of sewage input and uh, runoff from farms and detergents that were heavy in phosphates making their way into water supplies and into local waters. And this had a, and when this, these images were showed um, in Congress, they had a big big rippling effect on, uh, on our laws about uh, detergents and <laughs> pollution. There's a lovely eutrophic system somewhere in the world. I don't know where, I just like the pictures. I like these systems <laughs> also. Savannas I like, but particularly I like these, uh, these wetland systems at the ecotone, at the ecotone between water and land. Often your savanna is back behind here in Africa. You have a, a rim of, ve of trees, vegetation, a riparian zone, you would call it, if this were a flowing body. And then this ecotone, this interface between water and land. 
That's the system I study in Africa. Um, okay, so a couple of examples of uh, flowing systems. Of course, um, a big river like this starts as a bunch of little creeks and streams and smaller rivers that gather together to form a big river, right? And you might imagine the organisms that occupy a system like this and a system like this differ a lot from ones in lakes. They have many different physical forces to deal with. Flowing water is very different from still water. Ultimately, the river is going to flow into the sea, typically. There are counterexamples, but most rivers flow, ultimately, to the sea. And at the coast, they may form deltas like this, where they back up and form all these channels. It's a delta system, deltaic system, and an estuary. This area where, this area influenced by the tides of the ocean, where you get some salt water input, some marine input, but with continuous freshwater output, is a mixed, um, mixed water system, a brackish system, if you want, that we call an estuary. And they're very productive systems, these estuaries. High nutrient input from the continental surface and uh, organisms and salts from the ocean mingling together. And especially in a tropical environment, this is a recipe for a lot of uh, biological activity. Marine zones, we, distinct, we divide up um, much like we do the freshwater zones in terms of light penetration, photic and aphotic, distance from shore, just swap terms a little bit the neuritic zone, the oceanic zone, and uh, again, open water and bottom, pelagic and benthic. So those are the same. Those terms are the same. The continental shelf and the intertidal zone. The intertidal, remember, is just that zone between the uppermost high tide and the lowermost low tide with its characteristic organisms. And in some ways, you can consider this an ecotonal system an ecological system between two other major systems, an oceanic one and a terrestrial one. It's an intertidal system. That term ecotone, um, I won't formally define, but hopefully you're getting the idea of what I mean by it. An intertidal system, pies aster perhaps, there are your mussels, your barnacles, your algae. Nice system with your keystone predator pre present. Beautiful anemones. You can see this right down coast here. You can see tide pools like this on our coast, and I urge you to go check them out. <coughs> and uh, coral reefs, of course, just, uh, just offshore, these shallow water reefs that receive so much um, solar input, um, as well as nutrients coming off of the oceans, occurring in waters that are um, very nutrient poor, typically. Tropical waters, you go to your beautiful tropical beach with your palm tree behind you and you're sipping on your drink um, and gazing on the lovely blue-green sea that you can snorkel in and see 25 feet down to the bottom. It's so clear and beautiful, that water, partly because it's so nutrient-poor and there's very little growth. But then you, you know, cross the lagoon, <coughs> cross the lagoon and you're on a reef like this that's just a riot of biological activity. How can you grow a reef like this in a nutrient in nutrient poor waters? Um, I put an article related to that on on B space in that um, in that news folder. So please read about it there. It's a um, required reading. Just a short National Geographic article can help you understand that, or at least a hypothesis for how that works. Photosyn chlorophyll plants that rely on chlorophyll, plants rely on chlorophyll for photosynthesis, absorbs visible light and reflects, tends to reflect other wavelengths of light, like infrared light. <coughs> Whereas physical surfaces, non-growing surfaces, reflect light differently. So you can take satellite images of the Earth and map and translate reflectance of light, of wavelengths of light, into um, different substrate types, vegetation versus stone versus sand. It reflects not only the vegetation, but productivity. So on a satellite image like this, I don't, I don't have what the, um, the scale bar is here, but this is um, measured in something like kilograms of carbon per unit space. You can get a sense for how productive these surfaces of the world are. The gray here is 
uh, no net primary productivity, less than zero net primary productivity in this great desert or um, in these polar conditions. And your reds and yellows are your more productive areas and your rainforests and so forth. Your, the ocean tends to be very low in productivity with some, with some huge dead zones in terms of productivity. But because of its enormous size, the ocean has almost as much primary productivity as the land surface, just because it's so big. But note carefully how, um, <coughs> how low in primary productivity it is, and this is primarily a consequence of nutrient limitations. It's most productive in <coughs> on coastal shelves where you either have upwelling of deep water oceanic nutrients or the flowing off of nutrients from the continents themselves. And this, um, this I'll let you, let you read carefully. It breaks down various ecosystem types and biomes in relation to the percentage of the Earth's surface area they occupy and their average net primary productivity. And you can see that um, some systems like swamps and marshes or algal beds and reefs are very productive, but they just don't occupy much of the Earth's surface. So in terms of the Earth's total primary productivity, they're fairly low. And that the tropical rainforests, because they're both so productive and so numerous in terms of space on Earth, they occupy, they account for so much of Earth's primary productivity. I'm losing you guys, so you can study these things on your own time and read about them in the book. All right, see you next time. <laughs>